further ado, here is Daniel Klaus and Dana Gould. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hello, comics fans. <laughs> this is uh, the biggest crowd I've seen here since the James Elroy appearance, but the women look much less threatened, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, and we're here uh, ostensibly to talk about your new book, Wilson. Available at the front counter. Available at the front counter. Is your mic on? No, it's not. No. no. <laughs> How about now? I guess, there you go. I guess you're a pro. There you go. <laughs> Which one was the stand-up? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, and uh, we were uh, we were talking on uh, on the telephone. Uh, so uh, to, before we talk about the book, uh, how many people here have already read it? <laughs> how many people here are going to be really bummed out if we talk about it and you learn things you might discover within the book? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But we, I won't get too specific, uh, except uh, we'll talk extensively about the murder. The ending. Yeah, <laughs> the, the ending. Um, but uh, we were talking about the, the uh, Wilson's personality is, is he's really, a, he's a lot like a stand-up comedian in the way they really are in life, which is right. solitary. Angry. Uh, misanthropic. Uh, abrasive, abrasive, but all it's it's the people, um, it's the it's just the perfect combination of arrogance and self-loathing. <laughs> That's really what makes us. I guess I, I guess I would have to glue myself. To that. <laughs> I guess that what makes them so wonderful. Right. Well, as you as you said, Wilson is. Like ninety percent of your Christmas card list. Yes, exactly. Like, I know this. I not only know this guy. I spend most of my time hanging out with one variant yeah. of him. I find I'm very. Uh, I'm quite shocked by the reviews of people saying so nobody could be like this. <laughs> hmm. I guess I need a better sort of friend. <laughs> exactly. You don't travel in my circle. Right. Um, and and uh, I want to. We want to get into the uh, the audio visual portion of the show. Yeah. You have some of your old burlesque loops that you brought, I do. which I greatly I do. appreciate. My early work. Um, but um, but uh, the 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 book also has a uh, a, a form that you've not done uh, before. Uh, you've right. sort of set yourself up a uh, you set yourself up a challenge. That's right. <laughs> It raised a hurdle for myself. Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, I'm well, going to go read that book entitled Rape. <laughs> <laughs> Would you hand me that book right above Say. Me? <laughs> Yeah, right there. That giant, no, the one to the right. <laughs> Guys, if you're a single fella and you've got a gal over, this is not the deal closer you want just right. sitting on the bookshelf. <laughs> you looking at my books? Where are you going? <laughs> That guy's going to be doing a signing on Thursday. <laughs> what would the crowd be like the, for that? It's by, yeah. Oh, and it's by a it's by a chick. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Somebody's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I, I think you have to buy that. I kid the rape victims. I can't. Um, uh, so anyway, tell. So uh, Wilson has a specific sort of uh, motif. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's made up of seventy-seven uh, little one-page sort of gag strips. Like the the original impetus for this came from reading uh, reading like old Peanuts collections, you know, Charles Schultz. Mm -hmm. Where and if you read them in sequence, it's it's as though they have a narrative. You know, it's like there's like the Christmas strips, then the New Year's strips, then all of a sudden it's Valentine's Day, and then they're playing baseball. You know, and it's sort of it has like the, the semblance of real life passing, and it almost feels like there's this grand narrative mm -hmm. that's actually not. He does not impose on it. It just ha you know it has that sort of natural feel. And I thought that would be really cool if you sort of took that that notion and, and actually imposed a real narrative onto it. Yeah, and and what I also liked about it a lot was uh, that it you don't realize you're doing that until about you know until a little ways in. Yeah, it kind of. Surprises. I wanted it to just feel like, oh, it's just a bunch of silly gags with this obnoxious guy, and yeah. all of a sudden it coalesces into a story, and then when you get to the end, you kind of look back at the first few, and you, oh, I see how that related. Yeah, it's it's great. I, I because you well, here's a question I want to ask, and then maybe we'll get into the and the and the AB thing, but right. the AB. 
I don't know what to call it. Right. <laughs> the PowerPoint? Is that what it is? I guess. You're here to prove that they have weapons of mass destruction. That's right. Rockets. I have actually um, dossiers. But, <laughs> but I, I love the um, uh, that it 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 does jump uh, around and, and because you you've also written screenplays, uh, I often wonder like what sh do you do you think of this? Do you now you know do you think of movies as strips? Do you think of strips as movies? Because it, it's I look at this like I look at this as like I, oh I can see this is I can see this movie and I wish they would make the movie in the way you wrote it right yeah you know and, seven, and seven like, little like blackout sketches yeah right? and and that would be a very commercial film I'm sure <laughs> well, yeah. there's somebody out there who yeah. wants to make that film right now. yeah I've on more than one occasion been asked after pitching a movie what's the target audience of this movie <laughs> they're, they're old men yeah as, as Andy Kindler said it's men my age who are me. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, you know, who doesn't want an opera about Renfield? Right. right. <laughs> you know, I, I can't believe that Universal Studios is saying no to my Peter Cushing biopic. <laughs> Good day, sir. <laughs> um, uh, that's great. And um, and you, you, did you? When did you? Uh, did, did you set before you even started it that that's what you wanted to do, or did, how how far in advance you had this plot of that before you sat down to? to, to I mean, I, the. The way this story was born, I actually, my, my dad was like dying of lung cancer in the hospital, which is always the wellspring for mirth. A lot of great humor there. So I was, you know, I was like just sitting in the hospital for days, day after day, and I just read this Charles Schultz biography, and I was like really connecting my dad to Charles Schultz. They were like the same age, and sort of mm -hmm. these great, like gray haired, crew cut Midwestern squares. Right. And, uh, and so, it, like, this book was really hitting me on a deep level, and there's a part in the book where Schultz says something like, the difference between an amateur and a professional is that a professional can sit down and in 15 minutes have a workable cartoon for the next day's paper. And I thought, like, Jesus Christ, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who could do that? And I thought, oh, I That's actually that. the difference between an autistic person and a person. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I... Uh, so I, you know, that was my challenge, but I just had a little sketchbook in the hospital, and I thought, I'm gonna draw a couple 15 minute strips and see how it goes. Uh -huh. And this guy kind of just emerged from that. It was just like this, I needed like a funny character that had no thought, no forethought at all. Just he, this id creature emerging <laughs> onto the page. That's, that's really what it is. And then, and then the next thing I knew, I just couldn't stop. Like I just like, I was laughing, laughing at my own stupid cartoons that I'm drawing with my little, you know, stick figure. And people walking by the room, the you're laughing at like, your sick father. Yeah, but the nurse is like, dear God, he's lost his mind. <laughs> and so, uh, and so I drew hun literally hundreds of strips with this guy, um, and just like I knew the character, but I none of it, they, there was no story at all. I didn't even think, oh, I'll do a story. Mm -hmm. But once I knew the guy, then I sort of like, what's his story? And I realized. His father would die, and he's and he's totally alone in the world. And I thought that's you know that's his the the thing that gets him going, the engine that begins yeah. the story. Yeah, it is in in that way. It is you know, it, and and I think that I think it's fair to say that's a that's a theme that runs through a lot of your work. Perhaps. Um, uh, but it's uh it's it's heart it's heartbreaking, uh, you know, as it goes, hilariously so. Um, if, if you care about a guy like this, it, it is. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, or if you think that maybe you're him on some level. <laughs> 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 or if maybe on some level him. you think that it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's uh, that's uh, hilarious. Let's backtrack. We, you, have a, you have a PowerPoint presentation, well, uh, sort of. General Powell. Um, we're going to take you back to the golden days of the last days. Uh, and uh, do five minutes of your job. Oh Christ! <laughs> Can I do four? <laughs> I was, um, I was, but here's how. Here's like a really funny. Here's what a really funny person would say in right. that situation, as opposed to myself. Um, I, I, as many people, I'm sure people here have been to Lucha Vavum or have seen Lucha Vavum, which is a. Okay. It's for you know it's the I've Mexican been. wrestling burlesque review that. We oh did. yes, of Natch. Yeah, Natch. Um, but we it's the, we do it at the Mayan Theater three right. times a year, and it's great. It's it's real mass Mexican wrestlers, and then every other match they have a burlesque routine, you know, uh, gotcha. like pasties and g-string, and it's it's a ton of fun. And um, one night uh, we were there, and a folding chair fight broke out, as is wont to happen. And I said to Gary Shandling, who was there and the, near the front, I said. 
uh, I'm going to bring you on now to do about 10. <laughs> uh, without flinching, he went, would you mind? See, you know, that's what a really funny person would say. Right. And look would at that. Mind? It took just enough time to tell that story, and now perfect. we're heated up. You're a pro. Look at that. Semblance this is, this of professionalism. Is my, uh, conceptual pieces. <laughs> this is like change? my new stuff. Yeah, can you do that? Do you know how to do it? Oh, what do I, I think what, if you press to this. This is, so this is a home computer. This is like a computer you could have in your home. It's a hand crank. <laughs> well, that did nothing. Let's see. Do we have any uh, nerds in the audience? I don't think so. <laughs> what, what would happen if I did? No, don't do that. No, no, no. <laughs> do not. Slideshow. Slideshow. From arrow to hand. Where do, where do I hit slideshow? <laughs> Now be my mother. Where? The top? <laughs> the top? The top? <laughs> View show? Would that do it? I don't know, honey. What if there's a fire? <laughs> Guess who doesn't sleep in my bedroom now? Your father. <laughs> huh, this is the lamest slide show ever. Uh oh. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> Spacebar. Space yeah. 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 Could you tell I did that? So, did you hear me throw my voice to yeah. get myself my <laughs> Um So you, we were talking about this on the on the on the uh, the other day. Uh, tell us tell us about what yeah. this is. Well, I mean, first of all, I put together this slideshow originally because I was my publicist wanted me to like go out and do this little dog and pony show where I would. <laughs> promote my book and so I put together all these slides and then I was like I cannot do I do not want to like go up and go like hey everybody here you know here's my great career let's have a trip into my egotism <laughs> so uh, so the, the idea was to have you know s people come and ask questions related to these slides right so uh, and but as it's turned out every single night I just wind up going through them by myself as I was going to do anyway so anyway um, so my my little impetus for putting this story in, this was a, a story by a science fiction uh, comic artist named Wally Wood, who is, uh, yes, <laughs> please no questions about Wally Wood after this, that's, uh, I've, asked, I've answered everything I ever want to answer about Wally Wood. <laughs> um, but he was, uh, he was sort of like the quintessential 50s sci-fi artist. And this was a story in the last issue of Weird Science magazine in 1953 or so, where he, uh, it was like a gift to him. Where in every panel it's like this sci-fi wet dream of, of uh, you know, dinosaurs and spaceships and dinosaurs on spaceships and beautiful <laughs> girls in spaceships fighting dinosaurs. It literally goes on for seven pages of just... It right. is. It is amazing how, in a lot of pulp science, it's it's yeah. all about. It's it's really all about rape. It's 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 all about space. It, it is basically. But um. But anyway, so it goes through seven pages of just sci-fi drawings, and then we get to. This this is the last panel, and we find out the the story is actually, Wally Wood drawing the story. It's like a meta thing, and. Uh, and this had like a huge impact on me as a kid. I remember seeing this, and this was like the first time I ever saw sort of like my my dream of what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like the greasy haired, you know, guy like smoking and yeah. sitting in a dark. It looks like he's in just in darkness in the middle of the night, you know, with like a his beer mug in the. I mean, he was like a hopeless alcoholic, and to put his beer mug is really dismal and like drawing in a gigantic, I didn't know you drew on such a big piece of paper until then, I mean it was just like it was everything I wanted to be in that, in that panel. And so like that was the minute I was like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be this guy. <laughs> that, that hairstyle by the way is called a full McGarrett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is, that is pretty McGarrett. That's a complete jet Anyway board. so, cut to. So, so you had this fantasy of how I amazing this guy is. Of, yeah. I wonder what his life looked like in, what Gosh, it looked like in real life. Imagine. Hey, <laughs> this is uh, this is poor Wally in in reality. Maybe like ten years after that panel was drawn, where he's like you know sitting on a mattress with a pegboard on the wall, <laughs> with, you know like he's obviously like typing a letter like you know dear editor, where's that forty dollars you owe me? For? <laughs> and we we don't even want to know what this is all yeah. about. <laughs> And that, like the phone, it's just like, I'm going to move it closer, maybe it'll ring now, you know. <laughs> and it just, you know, but 
the, the bottom line is I still want to be that guy and I still want to be I want to be sitting on that couch like to me that's the coolest thing in the world yeah so and, again tip, tips for uh, the late you know men who are interested in the ladies uh, I wouldn't have tools hanging over the bed <laughs> no poster that says dynamo saw, like, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's so, it's so easy yeah. to reach Nothing, and there's some something to do with Snow White right there. Yeah, it? nothing, nothing there. It says deal closer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. No. Oh, here we are. So this is this is me as an innocent lad. This is like right around the time I, I started drawing comics, and it I don't know, it just amuses me to see how how innocent I was. I was actually going to do like a hideous photoshopped version of that, and you're like, here here I am now. <laughs> That's a fantastic, uh, that's fantastic. So here's some early Do you still work. have that wig? <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> I still have that shirt. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is one of my early pieces, a caricature of Gerald Ford. <laughs> you know when your child is drawing Gerald Ford, <laughs> that it's, you know, time for therapy. Um, so this I like is, how his head is crushing his body. Yeah, yeah. It was a comment on Ford's, you know, why I can't remember. Um, so it, but at this time I wanted to be like, you know, Mort Drucker drawing for Mad Magazine, mm. a caricature guy. And so, you know, that's I was completely fixated on Mad Magazine. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's some actually earlier stuff. This is one of my, uh, one of my timeless classics that never thought I would see six feet tall. It's on a tiny piece of typing paper. This is, uh, I was probably 11 when I did this. And I did hundreds of these, just, you know, stupid parodies of, you know, I do like, instead of the night gallery, it would be the fright gallery. <laughs> Nobody even knows what the night gallery is. Oh, no, uh, sure they do. You do. Yeah. yeah that's true. So anyway, I wanted to work for Mad, and instead, here's my first published work in Cracked. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> so uh, the reason, I, the the way I got to but work, but it wasn't. Hey, it wasn't crazy. That's, it wasn't <laughs> sick. It wasn't crazy. <laughs> the way I got to work for Cracked was uh, my uh, my roommate at the time uh, answered a want ad in the uh, in the pay. It was like just in the paper, like in the New York Post or something. It was like wanted assistant at Cracked magazine, and oh, that sounds like a good job. And he went and got the job, and within 10 days, he was the editor-in-chief of Cracked. <laughs> That's literally true. <laughs> He's like, went from, went from literally working at, a, at like a record store answering phones to making 60 grand a year. That's great. That's it was so of, cool. It's kind of an apocalypse now. Who's in charge here? Ain't you! <laughs> <laughs> And, and who's, who's, it looks like somebody's making a fir his first appearance in the in the last panel. Yeah, there we are. That looks like our old friend. Oh, there we are. no. I look like Lloyd Llewellyn. Oh, no. Point. Everybody did back then. Um, I just like this cover because I can't believe I was in this magazine. It makes me feel so old. Like, this was this was like the current movie, Rocky II. <laughs> like, I think that's Rocky uh, IV. Four. That's four. Well, okay, sorry. But I mean, you know, Dolph Lundgren was still, uh, he was a viable star at this point. Mm -hmm. Back to the Future was in was in the theaters. I don't know, I just, that cracked me up that oh I was in there. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Um, have you seen uh, the, the last Rambo? I never did. You no. should really see it. It's, it's an <laughs> orgasm of <carnage. laughs> Okay. There it is. So now, you know, I don't want to like talk about every comic I did, but this is, this is the first... Uh, First thing I ever did, like on my own, oh. and this is uh, this is my dark period. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh, we lost oh, it. Oh, power. Wah, wah. You know, it's funny. I was at the store today and I saw sardines packed in oil, and th that they turn that around really quick down in the Gulf. They already got the stuff in the stores. <laughs> I know if you squint really hard at the Sex in the City 2 billboard, it looks like the Rolling Stones are doing a perfume ad. <laughs> so I'll step outside for a smoke. Hey, 
Here's my question. When you're outside of Grauman's Chinese Theater and you see the superheroes that pose for pictures, yeah. is it is it a wet homeless guy as Spider-Man or a regular guy as wet homeless Spider-Man? <laughs> I can never, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we're never going to see the pictures of our trip to Casper, Wyoming. That's right. I have lots of photos um, of my son. Do we know what Do we know what the deal is? Or? It's never done this before. Yeah, okay. It's a brand new problem. I think... Possibly, it's too awesome. <laughs> it exploded from awesomeness. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Well, let's, well, uh, well, let's uh, yeah, I can unplug and plug it back in. Let's try that. Okay, and so, but so you weird were, that we have nerds in the audience. Yeah, I know. Uh, isn't the isn't the inventor of this thing here? Jesus H. <laughs> um, and uh, so, but Lloyd Wilman was for fan graphics. Correct. Yeah, correct. Um, what was the jump from from uh, Cracked uh, to Fantagraphics? Um, when I was working for Cracked, I uh, I had a lot of spare time, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And thought, what you know? What should I do? Oh, cool. You know, I thought like, what should I do? And I thought, oh, I'm, I'll, I should draw like an undergroundish kind of comic. <laughs> Here, this is uh, this was to show sort of the context. You also are sporting a full McGarrett there. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I did. I felt like I called that the full Gumby, but yeah. Um, but you've got the forelock. You've got the yeah, yeah. The Jack Lord this, forelock. I was trying to find something that would show the context of the comic world in 1986, and <laughs> I was going to put together like a show of like you know different covers of comics and stuff. And then I found this photo, and I thought, okay, enough said. Yeah. <laughs> but it is that that absolutely is like you know a bunch of comedians hanging out. It, the show it truly the had to me. I, I have that that Jack Nicholson in The Shining quality. <laughs> and I, I wasn't in this photo originally. <laughs> I and was never the, there. And the Clockwork Orange poster is just is almost stabbing you in the head. Theory. I didn't even notice that. That's yeah. chilling. And that's a nice, that's kind of a, see, there was a, the guy in the front next to the African American woman, um, uh, sh that hair, I kind of had that hair and my wife says Excellent. it was a mullet, but it wasn't really. No, it's even worse. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a, a bad party in the back, and no business. <laughs> no, right, no, no business being done at all. So. Uh, now here you go. Here we go. So. Lloyd the way, I have this. Lloyd the hell in my. I have this issue at home. There so. you go. Is um, it mint? Um, <laughs> to finish my little Lloyd the story. Yeah. yeah. You know, I. Uh, I finished a. Uh, one story with this character that I made up in literally five seconds. Mm -hmm. like, what, uh, let's see, let's have a good character. Okay, a guy with a bunch of L's in his name. Fine, that's it. That's his personality. <laughs> Case closed. So I did a, I did like a ten-page story, and then I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? I don't. Nobody's going to publish this. And I saw there's this company called Fanographics that did the Comics Journal, and I thought, well, if I send it to them, they'll send me some feedback. I, I literally thought I thought they'd like you know circle. begging for notes yeah literally <laughs> like they would they would you know like circle you know the misspelled word or you know I don't know yeah. what they would do and so I thought well you know they'll give me some feedback and then years down the road I'll hone my skills and then I'll have my own comic and so then like three days later I get a call like we'd like to give you your own comic <laughs> I was like but I, I, just I'm not crunch. ready <laughs> exactly. Right, I just got the janitor job at Crack. <laughs> and so, but of course, I was not really ready to do this comic, and I wasn't really that into drawing this character that was sort of imposed on me, because that was who I submitted. Mm -hmm. And it was ultimately canceled, and uh, I was ready to give up comics, and I thought, well, I want I gotta do like one that I, that's like the one I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what this was. And the idea was to do like three issues and then slink out before they realized how much money I lost for them. Right. Uh, and you started like a Velvet Glove cast and I in the first. Did you did you know where you clearly? I, I can't imagine thinking you were only going to do three issues. You didn't have the breadth and scope of the. Entire I, story I thought, like, actually thought it was going to be three issues long. Uh, I thought oh, I, I can do like a three issue. Story. But I didn't that? even that's I didn't even know the second chapter when I did the first one. Like eighty eight. 89, 89 was when it was printed. Yeah. So I probably did it in 88. Right, because I remember when it came out, I thought it was Twin Peaksy. But Twin Peaks is actually after Velvet Glove by about a year. <laughs> Nobody remembers that. No, but but I, but Eight Ball <laughs> when it took a, when it started yeah. to roll. Yeah, yeah. Remind. Yeah. Now everybody's oh you saw Twin Peaks. And I was like no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you're a homo. <laughs> <laughs> That would be yeah for the oh 
Oh god, dude. Oh no. That's what happens when you say the H word. <laughs> I, it would be great if uh, I maybe for a, a brief moment I'll interview you like Jack Webb. Right. Okay. <laughs> Is your comic? Yes. I'm proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Stick of that <laughs> <laughs> so this is your book? Yes. Well, pardon me while I jump up and click my heels. <laughs> That's what he said once. Is this your apartment? Yeah, man. Well, pardon me while I jump up and click my heels. There was another great end of a drag note once where yeah. Gary Crosby was playing a painter. I remember that. Oh, where, where he asked to see a picture of, do you have a picture of your girlfriend? He goes, yeah, man, I got a picture. And it's like an abstract <laughs> painting, and the, he, he and Harry look at each other like, <laughs> and then he said, "This is—I swear he said this, or, I, or I'm remembering it incorrectly. He goes, I don't need to clean up, man. I'm an artist. I like Picasso. And then at the end of the episode, he's, all, he's the square John. Right. And he goes, uh, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, Picasso, uh, my apartment's kind of neat now. I, I don't feel like Picasso anymore. I'll bet I know somebody who would appreciate that. Mrs. Picasso. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. P. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Yeah. Now come on, this is so happy to so I... You so stole that from me. Man. Yeah, it was so. Yeah, but I love. Now, the, it's an interesting thing with uh, with the expressions on the faces. Is this um, is this a trade secret that uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you about? You have a you have a photo reference that you use for some of your stuff that I that I've seen. Do you know what it is? Is that the what is it? Well, let me ask you off, off mic. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I don't really use this for reference. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, it's because I thought it, well, when we were, we were at a, Shut we, were up. At, we, were at a <laughs> we were at a key party. Get a hint? We were at the world's worst key party. It was just before Colonel Sanders died. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to, oh man, but, uh, who was at the key party? Dan Klaus, Colonel Sanders, and me. It fucking sucked. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you have this collection of old mug shots right. that you buy. And right. it really is, and, and I just assume, because if you look at the, the fourth panel there, that does it, it's just people at the worst moment of their life. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. just like this, and they just have that look in their eye, and they're like, ah, fuck. <laughs> right. it, there's no more downhill. Right. That's <laughs> you know, just shoplifting at gimbals. Yeah. yeah. So clever. Uh, so while uh, while Velvet Glove was, I was trying to like capture my inner life in a narrative. I was trying to just like use my dreams and like weird, like just anything that felt uncomfortable. That like I don't want anybody to know this about me. I would okay. I'm gonna put that in. That was <laughs> that was how I did it, and that's why it was sort of fun to do and fun to read. I think, but. That was, so that was my inner life, and this was my outer life. This was like the world I was all of a sudden plopped into, you know, the comics world, mm -hmm. as, as you saw in 19, you know, in the late 1980s, right. which was not hospitable to, to my, my little, uh, you know, my, my little uh, coffee clutch of comic creators, you know, it was... Right. It you were in Chicago then, so... Yeah, yeah, and you know, you'd go into any comic store and you'd go like, hey, do you carry eight ball? And they're like, in the adults only box in the you know behind the curtain in the men's room you know under the guy the dead guy you know, just, it's in there with with you know elf the elf porn and you know yeah. just all this I never understood that I never understood I really don't and I the draw the like pornographic drawings it's like if, if you want to look at that the, the, there's a better thing available. There are photographs. Yeah. <laughs> there's a yeah. I've always actually admired that. I thought like that's that shows like some a certain artistic sensibility that I prefer these comic strips to the. You know. Yeah, no, I, I I get that. It's just not. Yeah. Carol uh, Carol Hernandez uh, Gilbert and this is what. Yes. Of course. Uh, Damn it. Told me a really funny story about like they would be because he. Um, they would be like talking. Oh, we gotta go to your mother's, and and uh, and then and she'd look, and he'd just be like drawing a giant cock. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I know. And, oh, they're gonna take out that same old ball of tied up Christmas decorations, and I really should just you should just stop off and get a new set of string lights. I don't know why these big veins. On this <laughs> it's really bizarre. <laughs> like, I'm a crazy. Uh, uh, Way to make a make a living. I never uh, 
There was a. I got a blind. I don't know if it's still there, but it. Uh, at Golden Apple, uh, it used to be the the adult section had those western doors. Right. So when you walk in, shame, shame, <laughs> shame. <laughs> right. so it was, it was, it was, oh, this is on the, I, actually I, I rarely quote my own jokes, but uh, this is actually a Simpsons joke that I wrote that I'm actually somewhat uh, proud of. Uh, when uh, when uh, um, Ralph Wiggum went into the porno section of the comic right. book store and it was just quiet and then you just hear him go, everybody's hugging. <laughs> <laughs> most, most of the great Ralph Wiggum lines are written by uh, by you. By George. Oh, by George. George. <laughs> so these are, you know, I don't really have anything to say about it. They're just like the funny little strips I did in my early comics. Uh -huh. I don't have any like backstage dirt on, on uh, <laughs> the in insignificant shrimp. No, but you do have a great. Uh, this is you know you have a, one of the things that I caught my eye originally uh, was that you have a great sort of mid-century aesthetic in your drawing. Oh, like. well, thank you. <laughs> Which, you, know, you stole that from Mad Men, I think, back in. I did. <laughs> This was a girl. Hey, I was a girl. My brother went to high school with it. I was totally in love with. He's probably now 60 years old. <laughs> Still hot. Still hot. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, and that is the. Uh, oh no, this is. I think in the. Well, there's because there's a the, an early uh, uh, relative of Wilson, is uh, and I think it's in. I'm not sure if it's in. It's not in. I hate you deeply. Uh, it's. There was a, the, the, the obese guy in the no fat chicks t-shirt oh, yeah. complained about uh, fat chicks on TV. It's, he's, he's like a cousin of Wilson's. I would think. Yeah, that was actually, uh, G Gilbert Hernandez told me that uh, one of my former publishers actually was like a was that fat guy, guy <laughs> and had a no fat chicks t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, so here's this is the, what the happens fat to is Lloyd unnecessary. The fat is unnecessary in that guy's t-shirt. Sure, sure. <laughs> so I got, you know, I was here's my franchise character, and I just turned him into like a jerk who lists all the things that I hate. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why don't you sell that font as like clouds? Yeah, because then it would be used for oh yeah, you right, know yeah. horrible comics. Right. And this was me in high school. <laughs> Ectomorph. This was, this story weirdly has there's like a lot of. Super skinny guys will come up to me at a signing and go like, "I used to wear two pairs of pants too." <laughs> <laughs> this is sort. This is almost an early version of Wilson, like a scarier version. Uh -huh. I was like this cover. Yeah, and my suicide is one of my favorites. Yeah, I was always concerned in writing suicide notes. I was never sure of the spelling. And Wait, I you don't want people going, oh, yeah, an hey, idiot. Look, Dana committed school kind. What should we do? <laughs> don't ponic. Call the Paleys. <laughs> There's our school confidential. Now, this, here's a story here. Yeah, this was, you know. I, I did you this, stole this from that movie, our I school did. I did. I did this, uh, I, I actually did this story like the day my student loan came due. <laughs> Up till then, I wasn't all that bitter about it. And then I was like, I have to pay eight thousand dollars for that. I don't. But I'm not working. Yeah, it was eight thousand dollars for four years of art school back then. You know, it was like may as well have been eight million dollars. <laughs> and uh, I think I paid like twenty dollars a month for you know ten years. Or so. And uh, but I thought like oh, I'll just do this story to like. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Talk amongst yourselves. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. I decided, Bill Gates. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, who's the uh, PowerPoint hey, nice. version Steve of Steve Jobs? Right. Um, but I thought I really thought like five of my friends I went to art school with would be amused by this because I basically <laughs> like, drew actual people and um, and I thought nobody else will get this. It's just it's literally to crack up three friends and and uh, and then of course everybody said like this is exactly like it was in my art. <laughs> that was I was horrified to find that out. Was the was the film uh, did that come from Terry uh, or did were you guys like after Ghost World were you just like what else you got? It was actually we came up with it before Ghost World. Mm -hmm. It was like before Ghost, someone, like while Ghost I World was being made. It was like let's do that one. That was Terry. Yeah, Terry wanted to do it. Uh -huh. That was his thing. Even though he never went to art school, had no connection to art school at all. He just thought 
Uh-huh. It's you a, would intrinsically dislike art school. Now, school. say that again, because I want to, you, Ghost World was the one that you, you had started that, and then you decided that you had art school was on the rails when you ended up doing Ghost World, or? Ghost World took, I think, six years before we wrote mm-hmm. a script, and then, and then, you know, told all our friends and family, it's going to be a movie. Yeah. And then six years later, it was actually made. Right. <laughs> right. So <laughs> yeah. we had a lot of downtime. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know the reason I say that is, um, the Coen brothers wrote Barton Fink <laughs> in the middle of a, either Miller's Crossing or Hudsucker Proxy. Like right. They were stuck. And they just said, oh, let's write a movie about a writer that's stuck. Right. And then they wrote Barton Fink, and then they sort of broke their writer's block and went back and finished the right. other movie. It's such a great story. So this, uh, You're still living this is my right? sellout phase. This was... Uh, <laughs> This was a uh, slacker cola. This was an absurd product. In, uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, this was uh, Coca Cola. This photo says to me, by the way, just, the '90s. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Coca Cola decided that you know there was this whole like slacker generation who didn't like to be sold to, so they were going to create sell a product. <laughs> they were, well, they were going to. How do we sell to them? They thought, well, we'll create a product and we would just say like. This stuff isn't really very good. It's like you may, you you could buy it or not. We don't care. It's uh, life is worthless. All this stuff, you know, all the stuff I've been selling in my comics. Up right. then. So uh, I told them, you know, my comics don't sell very well. This is not going to be like a big. This isn't going to be a big. Is that Coca Cola? Co- like, this is actually is it, an is ad it like agency. An Emerald City or something. <laughs> no, it was an ad agency that that got carte blanche. You know, and right. I just I could not believe it kept going. It was one of those projects I was like, I just, I can't stop d- working on this because I cannot believe it's still going. Right. <laughs> Every day you think like, okay, that we're not going to do the, the cola that, you know, we're going to say is terrible. We're not going to actually do that. And, uh, you know what else came of, well, I was going to say, it, and so it, it cut to, it actually is released and and you know, foisted on the public, and then it wound up losing so much money. It lost, <laughs> it lost more money than any product in Coke's history, including <laughs> new Coke. Including it new it Coke. was uh, so. I, I like to think that my uh, my anti corporate cred is totally solid because I lost <laughs> how many how many out here have lost millions of dollars for a multinational corporations? Was it just was it Coke inside? No, it was this orange. Thing. It was. I remember, like, when we were doing, it, I said, "Well, what kind of, what, like, what kind of soda is no, it?" No. Yeah, they said, "We're not sure. We're not sure. We tried a few." And uh, and I said, like, "Well, like, what color is it? We don't know yet. It's green or orange." But so, but the the funny little story about this is that they, to to, do, to draw this face, they sent me what's called, you know, to a professional illustrator, a mock-up. And so they, what they did was they took. It's actually a drawing of my head from a, from a story I did. That's like an autobiographical parody story I did, and then they took the oh. face. Oh well, so much for my little joke. Um, try to remember what you were just you know, looking at. No, it's funny. I just realized the slideshow is working just like the book. You get a little. It's bit It's right. Of it's a over. blackout. The, well, if you can recall what that can looked like up there, the uh, the the interior of the face is taken from another drawing I did, and it's. The, the art director put it together. I just r- basically traced the drawing he sent me. And the amusing fact is that the facial features are from a drawing I did of Charles Manson. And, uh, so, that, so that actually Coca-Cola put Charles Manson on a can. Charles Manson was kind of a beautiful young boy. When you look he, was at him, like, yeah. he was a handsome guy. He was a fancy lad was how yes, he referred to himself. I believe so. Um, oh. <laughs> No, I think it's got, no. Try it again. Uh, oh, it came on. Oh, there you go. There, you go. there we go. We're all right. We're all we're right. We're good. We're uh, good. The show Cougar Town came about not dissimilarly. It was <laughs> it was a joke. It was a joke pitch in the writers' room of the show Scrubs. It was like, what is the most cynical fucking show we could Cougar think of? And then they <laughs> and they made it. And, uh, and cool. uh, yeah, that happens sometimes. We did that on uh, on the Ben Stiller show. We they want they we had a sketch called. The Grungies, which was a parody of the Monkees, <laughs> right. but it was a grunge band. Right, a 90s match. Yeah. Right, and uh, they they were like, we, "That's a show." I'm like, oh. "Please no." <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. And yet, and yet, you know, they're selling the OK Cola. They're selling to cynical people. Right. Nothing is more cynical than that product. It's of course, of course. Which is a, 
was the great appeal. So now back, meanwhile, back in comics, here's uh, Ghost World. Mm -hmm. Who's that? That's uh, that's the gal from is Ghost that, World. Is that okay? Oh, no, I know. No, 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 no. I like look to Lolly Bryant. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to embarrass her. No? Oh. Now this is a I, I'm a, this is a world of ghosts. Tell me about that <laughs> spooky cartoon. Right at the same time, Woo! same time go, the movie Ghost World was in the theater. The John Carpenter Ghosts of Mars was also <laughs> in the theater. And, Too disaffected. And a, a friend of my parents went to see that. <laughs> and it was pretty good. Your son's doing pretty good. I will. I will top that. <laughs> wow. When, when uh, Mark David Chapman was arrested after shooting John Lennon, they said he was reading The Catcher in the Rye. Right. So my, my one brother of the, of the several, the one that is as dumb as a bag of hammers, went and read Bob Euchre's The Catcher <laughs> in the W-R-Y and could not figure out the connection. Bob Euchre, famous professional baseball That's the greatest. player. Yeah, fantastic. The whole thing. No, I don't get it. <laughs> sure, the writing's bad, but kill somebody? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Ghost World was just great. God, you know, men don't famously write uh, well-developed uh, women characters, and uh, this is a quite. This is actually a genuine achievement. Well, there you go. Here's this How is the one. This How is the one with that? me. Why are chicks crazy, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> This is me making my little appearance in the story, which uh -huh. I felt like uh, You're Hitchcock I'm, I'm actually like drinking OK Cola. <laughs> um, I sort of felt like as I was working on this, I thought like I've some I've sort of implied that like I'm friends with these girls, like I'm eavesdropping on what they're saying, and like and I thought like well I should I should like allow them to scrutinize me in the same way they would anybody else, and. I, I finally realized this is this is what they would see. Mm -hmm. That was like me at every every signing I ever did at a comic <laughs> store until like you know two years ago. <laughs> and as you as you develop the um uh, as you develop the movie and as it as it moved you know did it did did you have uh, any insecurity about sort of letting go of the narrative of the of the novel and, and letting it become its own thing or did you you know I. I knew it had to be a very different thing. Like when I first started working on it, I just like I thought oh, this is the easiest money I'll ever make, and I just like t typed up the lines from the script. Uh, Here you go. Yeah. And <laughs> it's forty-five pages. That's not long enough, you know. And, and uh, you, you see, know, you have a lot of drawings. In over, yeah, exactly. Wait a minute, that's just a comic. Um, but over the course of you know nine hundred drafts, I finally realized like, oh yes, it's, I've got to actually like just forget about the comic and turn it into a movie. And then it actually it was sort of fun once I. Well, that is the fun. Threw everything yeah. away, you know. That yeah. is the that is the fun part of writing when yeah. the story actually takes over and it's. And yeah. No, no, it's over here. When Jack. it was sort of like <laughs> it's like oh, I get another chance to do a, like a different version. You know, this could have been the version I did in the comic, but it wasn't. But right. You know, there's a million versions you can do. Right. And do you do you see um, traces of like the you know when when do you envision that the, it's the character from Ghost World and Iron Man 2, or is it is Scarlet separate from that? I would like to think that she would have grown up to become a super villain. I think, she, yeah, no, I think she was in the spirit, actually. I haven't seen uh, Iron Man 2. Nor have I. I don't go to movies whose trailers rape my face. <laughs> <laughs> These are some uh, behind the scenes photos of. Creepy dude with these two. Oh, she's not so tall. The reason, uh, reason I had that B on my shirt was that at the time Scarlett was very upset that uh, she was sort of the B-list actress of the film. You know, she was like the second banana, and Thora was the big, uh, the big lead actress, Thora Birch. And so, uh, she convinced me that I was like the B, uh, like B, by being the writer, I was like the B-list, you know, creative person on the film, so she made me wear this like scarlet letter B all day when I was a sadistic little girl. Whatever happened to her? Yeah. This, oh, is one of, this is one of the many great awards that we won for our screenplay. This is the Zachy Gordon Award for Screenwriting Excellence, given to Ghost Story. <laughs> and uh, ter Terry and I... Uh, we, we trade this off every year, and so when I put together this slideshow, I realized, oh, Terry's got the Zachy Gordon Award. I need that for my slideshow. That's my proudest achievement. So I asked him to take a photo, and he was 
took weeks and weeks to take this photo, and really? it's, I just love how it's just completely caked with dust. I just love that, about, and, that and I love that it's on a doily too. Yeah. I think that's, well, it's, that's it everything that like says it all about. It just looks like an, a, just like a bad lamp. It's, it's a nice. hurricane lamp, and it's like this tall. Oh, it's yeah. enormous. <laughs> now, David, David Boring actually was. Uh, I, I felt you sort of consciously moved into a in a, in a different. It's a much more external story than uh, there's a lot the events seem to be dictated more by uh it's not as internal a story as ghost yeah i mean ghost world is very uh that was my only char attempt at a serious character question. driven <laughs> and david boring i really was i was sort of interested in following a plot even a, like a crazy plot that you could never put in a movie i was really i wanted to do a comic that could never be in a in a movie and i started doing it as a parody of a movie with like a three-act structure mm -hmm. but it just goes it it's such a serpentine plot that you you know it would be it would be like a mini series instead like, of a movie. Yeah, well, you had a funny quote. It was like it was on the beach meets yeah, uh, Nabokov. <laughs> yeah, it was like Finnegan's Wake meets Gilligan's Island or something. Finnegan meets Gilligan. There's a huge gulf in between those two, and it fits in there somewhere. Yeah, probably everything ever done is between those two. And yet, did you still get calls? That's a movie, Dan. I did. I yeah. did. You can actually actors wanted to buy it, and you can imagine just imagine what actors might think oh. they look like David Bourne, and that and you would be right. Uh huh. <laughs> right. There he is. There we go. Uh, this is another comic I did. Yeah. But this also, and now we're moving in. But this looks like a progenitor of Ice Haven as well. That was yeah. That was uh, that was the comic version of Ice Haven. Right. And what was your? And that was another. Uh, uh, you get to this place where you start to do these when you do these one-offs. They 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 all have these unique framing devices. It's it's very admirable that you don't just keep pimping out your trick. <laughs> this well, this what I did. I I started to do this as a, like an an antidote to David Boring because that was four years of like working in this really meticulous style, this kind of oppressive black and white style. And I thought, I'm just going to do a whole bunch of like funny gag strips. And I... Uh, Walking away from the slime you probably... And as I, was, as I was doing that, I... Uh, this story just kind of emerged out of nowhere and it, it turned into something much more... It was actually much more complex than David Boring it by the time it was done. Yeah, because so it's, it's all these different... I can't control myself, that's... The, did you did you find that once you started to get it, working into uh, working in making money writing screenplays that you, you can't money wait, well, you, yeah. <laughs> you gotta talk to my wife I just um, <laughs> but when, once you do start working in that uh, medium that it, it 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 you can't help but have it inform the other stuff that you do yeah I mean one of the one of the the uh, you know things that engendered this was. Uh, working in film and seeing how how easy it was to change things like you could edit things and you can move everything all around and you can mm -hmm. just do things I never I always thought you shoot a movie and it just you put it together in sequence in like three days and that and there you you know send it to the theater mm -hmm. I didn't realize you spend months like reordering everything and how, how much you could change things you cannot do that in comics for the most part you know no. you can't if you want to move a panel from page four but you should be you know, able to do it in movies <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah, but it, but literally, it's spatially impossible in a comic to move a panel from one page right. to the next. You, you know, you have to stick it in between panel. I mean, you just—it's right. literally impossible. So you're kind of stuck with what you've got. So I kind of thought if I did these little short stories, you know, one and two page stories, I could at least change the order of those stories and have some control over it. And that, that was that was very, uh, you know, that, that made it much less oppressive in a way to be able to do that. Yeah, what, what I thought when I first started reading um, the, the Wilson, and I, it, I thought where it was going in, uh, it would be interesting to do, is to tell the story of, of his life, but track it through different ages. Like to tell, like, you know, like flashback yeah, to that a was story. Actually, like, that, the original idea was... Just so we know this is Spider-Man. You created Spider that yeah. character <laughs> of Spider-Man. Um, I was originally going to do Wilson's entire life, you know, like from cradle to grave, and mm -hmm. that just seemed a little gimmicky. So, and I thought this was sort of this was the I wanted to just cut everything out of the story that wasn't exactly, you know, meaningful to me in some way. So it's uh, well, there's one there's really no funny padding at all. There's one really funny uh, thing. Spoiler just one funny thing. The, no, the, the thing that really made me laugh is uh, suddenly he's in prison. 
Right. And it's just it's so, you to, don't need to see it, which is makes it so much so much funnier right. to me. Yeah, and I obviously had whoops, ten, like ten pages in between those two strips, and then yeah. I kept cutting and cutting and cutting, and then it was okay. There we are. It's always I I know I I, I don't know how this came to be, but I always imagine like they're when they were writing King Kong like. How the fuck do we get this thing to New York? I got an idea. He's in New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you know? Yeah, that works. That works. Yeah, we're great. So this is actually a big, uh, this big um, <coughs> kind of um, self-important story I was working on. I spent like a year writing this, uh, this like a, my big Hollywood story, and I was really uh, trying to do, you know, the great American graphic novel and. I, I had it all kind of written out and plotted out, and I drew, I wound up drawing like seven or eight pages, and then one day I woke up and I just thought, like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. Like, I, <laughs> to try to do, like, a great graphic novel is really, like, the dumbest thing you could ever do, and I, f I just hated myself for even thinking that <laughs> way. Even though I actually kind of like this, I reread it recently, it's actually pretty good. And I may do it someday, but just I felt so unclean doing that that I... I abandoned it, so it's. Uh, I haven't even looked at most of it. That's your great. That's time. your like d l bottom drawer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel unclean doing everything. Yeah, and so I was, you know, at, after I abandoned that, I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I got a call from uh, the New York Times Magazine, and they asked me to do this weekly strip. So I did. I, I was like on the phone with the editor, and I, oh, what am I? What, what do I do for that? And she said, you know, you could do like you could just do anything. You could do like a. Like, you know, you could do like a romance story. And I thought, aha, what would I do for a romance story? Like, what would my romance be? And then I tried to think, like, this is for readers of the New York Times Magazine. So I tried to imagine the quintessential reader of the New York Times Magazine, like just this schlubby, you know, 46 year old lonely schmuck who wants to, whose like fantasy is basically to meet a girl he can read the New York Times Magazine. <laughs> and, Everybody. Uh, that guy, it, the, this person, the, the name I'm going to reference is not that person, but, <laughs> but those people all look like Robert Smigel. <laughs> but Robert has a lovely wife and gotcha. children. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so that was that was my impetus for this was a romance with like the schlubby New York Times reader guy, mm -hmm. and uh, anyway, and I did it. <laughs> I'm going to keep going even though it's I'll important. just pretend they can see the slides. Mm -hmm. Envision, uh, if you will. Wow, so is that, I guess that's Scarlet in her trailer. Oh my, oh, did that get in there? <laughs> <laughs> These are uh, New Yorker covers. I actually <laughs> thought the, the, the one, the guy on the right in the space suit looks so much like a producer I know, I thought it was him. And he's, Stuart Cornfield? No, it's yeah. not. It was a, no, I like Stuart's a friend. Oh. Uh, they said no. The producer I was like was the only man in my life I've yelled at. Wow. I'm wow. Person in my life. Nice. Yeah. A guy named Bob Cooper. When you know, I said when I was a kid, I wanted to do, I wanted to work for Mad Magazine, but my dad wanted me to work for the New Yorker, so those, <laughs> those were for him. Although, I got my first New Yorker cover as when my dad was in the hospital and. It literally came out two days after he died. It was, oh. it was pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable. Well, God's a cock. Thanks, David <laughs> Remnick. <laughs> so this is one Thanks, of the. Thanks, Killy McGee. <laughs> this is uh, this is one of the little uh, strip. This is not my new style. This is. Uh, <laughs> this, this is your back to basics. <laughs> yes, exactly. My caveman style. Um, this is this is one of the little strips I drew sitting in the hospital. So this is, they kind of all looked like this. Well, actually, this is one of the most accomplished looking ones. <laughs> well, that's a grim time. This is is your mom uh, still? Around? My mom is with us. Yes. I have her ashes in my bag. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, mom. My dad. Uh, I, uh, my. My mom had some sort of medicinal reaction. My dad came home the other day and found my mom on the floor with some pliers pulling the worms out of the carpet. Are you serious? I'm totally serious. Wow, yeah, you couldn't make that up. It's like, uh, I, and I thought, you know, they took her to the hospital. I thought it'd be great if I had to fly back and come in the house is actually full of fucking worms. Yeah, right. Idiot. She was right. Put her back on her heart medication. <laughs> <laughs> no, and she did that great. You know, there's a wonderful thing about parents. She has, like, you know, 
she's the perfect American. She takes 7,000 drugs. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and they say, well, the doctor told me to stop taking my blood pressure medication for a week. And, um, and then the greatest words that come after that, which I knew were coming. So what I did instead, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the doctor told me to get over a pneumonia, I should just stay in bed and relax. So instead, I put on a witch's hat and ran around the post office. <laughs> Great, Mom. It's amazing you don't get better. So on that note, here's, this is my dad in the hospital. End of slide. Um, Hilarious! Here we are, yeah. <laughs> Um, and here we are, and then you've worked all the way up to... This is the first page of the book. I love right. people, I'm a people person. <laughs> it all goes downhill from there. I love that last panel of, uh, and just that's And when I turned the page and saw that that was it, but it was the same the end. <laughs> But no, it's, it's great that when you turn, the, like you know instantly what you're in for. <laughs> right. Like when you, it's so right. great. It's so great. And mm -hmm. as I was saying, uh, it, and it is one of those great books that, like, even though you want to read it chronologically, I was like, my wife was reading something, I was reading something else. I said, not just read this one, just, just read this one. Really yeah, my goal was to do it. I always figure, like, when you, when you take a book off the shelf, you, like, open it to the middle. You know, nobody ever, like, starts at page one. They just say, you open it to the middle, look, you know, look to see what it looks like. And so I thought, you know, I wanted a book where people would open it to the middle and go, like, oh, it's funny little comics, I'll read the, you know, and kind of get sucked into it. Mm -hmm. No, it's really... So we'll see if that works. It's, incre it's incredibly, it's a great, it's a great device. It's, it's one of your, it's one of your best pieces. Well, thank you. Really. Not your best. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I well, we're finished. My, as I've said, as I, because I, Tested you for as much of the art as I uh, Immortal Invisible. I just love so much. Oh, yeah. And uh, but it's it's not a, it's also that sort of. They're not totally different. They're, he's also a painfully lonely kid. Right. You know. This is yeah. Trying yeah. to get grown up to be Wilson for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I love the thing that that I my, I'm, I'm obsessed by that year where you're too old to go trick-or-treating, yeah. but too young to do anything cool, Right. and you're just kind of stuck. I had a couple of years like that. I yeah. Guess. I actually had one that uh, is, a, it's a, while well, we're doing, um, in 1977, yeah. I was arrested for shoplifting in the afternoon, stealing soap. <laughs> Duh. Like, you know, like stealing a gun the day before the president comes. Right. And, uh, and, uh, there was a, I lived in a small town, so they just called my mother. My mother couldn't, I didn't get in trouble, because who taught me to shoplift? My mother. <laughs> oh, man. She was crazy. And we used to s steal groceries and deduct the money from the grocery list, and she would send it to Oral Roberts. Wow. Um, and I ended the night uh, egging cars with a Catholic priest. There you are. Mm-hmm. Didn't even make a move. Quite a day. Yeah, you didn't even make a move. Didn't make a move. You were a homely child. I asked him later, what was the deal? He's like, I don't know, I just wasn't Indian. <laughs> I'd have done something, it's spruced up. Uh, and here we are, and now we're in, uh, and now we're in, the in airport. Uh, yeah. yeah, in high dungeon of, of, yes, of the Wilson. Yes, this is the yeah, quintessential Wilson. Yeah, it's, and, and it does, and it also, I, now this is his daughter. Right. Which I also loved, such an incredibly, you're almost waiting for the super hot chick. Like, because right. that would be the funny, right. contrary. Right. Like, but this is exactly who it would be. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's so well the observed. Goth girl. Yeah. yeah. So well observed. Um, so this was, this book was sort of uh, like my role model for Wilson. Like I wanted, I just wanted it to have that kind of presence, you know. Where I remember my dad had this book when I was a kid, and I used to, I didn't even really look at it. It was sort of like over my head, but it's like. You see it, and it's like, it's about Big George, and there he is, and you're going to open this book, and it's going to be all about Big George. <laughs> and it's a book, you know, it just had this imposing, like, it's a book about, and you're going to close it, and Big George is done, and you can put him on the shelf. What was, what was Big was Big George was like, like was a like gag strip by this great artist, Virgil, Virgil Parch, who went as VIP. And, Were uh, they uh, body? No, no, he does sort of look like a like a uh, a body fellow, but he was actually kind of a just a schlubby kind of nondescript guy. Oh. But he looks um, like he might cross paths with the Femlin at some point. Yeah, he does, but it, no, no. 
but anyway, I just I like just the bookness of that image. And, and when I when I you know called the publisher, I said I want the thickest boards. I want like the <laughs> thickest paper. Like I want a book that can take a bullet. You know, I just want it. I want like my readers to be protected with this book. And but people I'm going to go down with a sinking ship that is book publishing with a you know, <laughs> solid book. Like I don't want some what, stupid little book. You know. you know why they put Big Macs in a box right. when they don't need to? Why? People like things in a box. There you go. So this is like better than a box. Absolutely true. And there he is. There he is. The end. The distance is really <laughs> Fantastic. So we could answer a question. Can I tell them what we're doing tonight? <laughs> if you want to, yeah. He has, Dana has to leave in 15 minutes because he has to fly to China to pick up a baby. <laughs> and that, that's not a joke. <laughs> that's not a joke. Uh, yeah. That's pretty cool, I think. It's, it's a good excuse. It's anyway. a good excuse. If, you're not, the, uh, if I don't see a baby next time I see you, <laughs> wait a minute, you just want to get out. Yeah, my wife is going to be so freaked out when I come home with this wagon. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was, it's an odd, it's an odd uh, situation. We have two other children right. from uh, China. And we you don't need to justify yourself. Yeah. It's fine. We thought to triangulate would be good. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, Two of them against each other. Yeah. As I said, when we told my mom originally that we were adopting a baby from China, she. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Are you going to teach her English? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a great thing. As, you, as they get older, sometimes you just why don't you just keep talking, and I'm going to think about the person you used to be when I was younger, and weep softly into this. <laughs> <laughs> into this pillow. Let's, let's get some questions So any going. questions, yeah. You're right in the front. Uh, right there. I can actually see you. Yeah. Um, have you ever considered uh, putting your cartoons into animation? Have you ever considered? <laughs> <laughs> no, you probably should repeat that. Uh, he sure did ask me if, if uh, no, I'm, I was just kidding. Um, have you ever considered putting your uh, cartoons in anim animation? I know Matt Gronig. And he, <laughs> has a, he actually has a deal now. He just eats dead leaves and shits money. <laughs> um, yeah, I did. I did a. Uh, an animated video for the Ramones years ago, like in 1995. It was like their last video, I believe. And it was. It was. I. I literally got the phone call on like June 1st, 1995, and they said, you know, we need this by. This is going to be on the air June 30th. <laughs> it was like the first I'd heard of it. Yes, sir. You know, yeah. and so uh, so it was not you know it was not my most developed work, but um, it was a lot of fun doing that. And I don't know, I, there's something about animation that really bugged me for a long, long time. And uh, a couple of years ago, there was this film called Fears of the Dark, and uh, it was this French film. And they got Charles Burns and a couple other artists to do. Uh, to do animated films, and they got this guy named Richard McGuire, who's this great artist, to like just direct and do his own um, little segment of it. And I thought it, it was so blew me away. I thought it was like so. It was uh, on the level of Hitchcock. Like it's just the most fantastically done thing. And when I saw that, I thought like, oh, maybe maybe animation could be okay. Is so it all animated? Or? Yeah, it's all animated. It's and it's fear of the dark. Fear, yeah, fears of the dark. Cool. And. Uh, and anyway, so that's uh, that's something I would like to do if somebody will throw money at me someday. Interesting. Fears of the dark. Fears of the dark. It was it's kind of like your ghost story. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, you know those Rick, you know those Richard Linklater sort of quasi animated films. Right. That's that's also face rape to me. I think. <laughs> Stop it. Leave me alone. Man. <laughs> Movies that poke you in the head. <laughs> um, some You're a sensitive fellow. <laughs> I, I just sit there with a damp cloth. Uh, anyone else? Well, there's, there's a hand there's over there. There's a guy. Yeah, um, see, I don't know if this question invites some kind of negative response, but I remember reading uh, some I like your I like your setup. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably call me technically a Nazi for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it? Go ahead. In a comics journal interview, oh, boy. Uh, I referenced to your brother as the... Uh, as My poor brother. ...in the best testing. Was it not? Okay. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, oh, he was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he had the highest IQ in the history of the California penal system. California. <laughs> 
He He's, really did. I'm serious. Your brother? Yeah. Was he incarcerated? He was. Yeah. He's, uh, he actually um, lives in Chicago and, and rehabs houses for a living. He's, he's an all right guy. Can you t say what he was in for? Or would it, you was a, it was a drug-related uh, thing. My brother is a prison guard. They might know each other. <laughs> I don't know what he said to his job counselor. I don't like anal rape per se. I like the idea of it. I can see it as a part of my job. Theoretically. I like to be a referee. or uh, I like it to be a part of my work environment. I just don't want to specifically be involved. Um, it will stun you to know that I've said that in shows. Uh, yes, the guy that looks like the first series of fuzzy haired GI Joes. <laughs> um, I actually wrote that Death Ray story when I was about 15 years old after reading Spider Man. You know, it's just my version of that. And, uh, I just really related to the Spider Man character because I lived with my grandparents and and you know I was a resentful skinny twerp who <laughs> wished I had been bitten by a spider you know and, and so uh, so when I I don't know a few years ago when I, I was trying to think what should I do for my next comic and I thought like what would be the, like the stupidest thing you could do and I thought oh, yeah, like a real life superhero that would be like that's like the dumbest thing you could do <laughs> and I'm gonna do it and so that's and so I actually like because that story because I wrote it when I was 15 it had like this really intense emotional impact on me as as things you write when you're 15 will do and of course I completely rewrote it but it had it the character looked the same and it had sort of some of the basic <coughs> plot elements now that was option wasn't it yeah, yeah. did that movie star Jack Black want to make that he's he uh, still might mm -hmm. I believe Ben Cooley is here he might have a check uh -oh. for you he's <laughs> gonna bring out a giant check <laughs> <laughs> here you are ten dollars I can put that in the contract all my checks will be oversized <laughs> foam core <laughs> checks foam um, court. yes at all I'm done with maybe doing it in comic book you know saddle stitched pamphlet form just because that that feels like it's you know it's old news but um, as, as far as Oakland yeah Wilson is Wilson is very much a guy from Oakland and I, I uh, he lives like you know two blocks from my house and anybody who like you know wants me to take them around Oakland I could do a walking tour of Wilson's you know uh -huh. Wilson's haunts, you know. um, and then that story, Mr. Wonderful, is actually on the, on like the other street near my house that I hang out at. So it'd be very easy to figure out where I live if you wanted to do uh, <laughs> Oakland research. Uh, 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 Mix uh, name. Um, well, I tell I tell us um, about the uh, the awesome amusement park uh, in Oakland. Children's Fairyland in Oakland, which was supposedly the. The basis, the, the the thing that gave Walt Disney the idea for Disneyland, and it's but it's it's like the Oakland version of Disney Disneyland <laughs> in that it is extremely run down and sad, and it it will like inspire tears more than laughter. <laughs> but you know, yeah. but it's but I love it. I love yeah. I'd much rather go there than Disneyland. I mean, it's much more. It's I like really to, I like to be moved to to <laughs> sobbing as I'm watching my son, you know, sadly go around a rusty merry-go-round. <laughs> it's really like the amusement park Jack Klugman went to in Twilight Zone, and <laughs> mommy was killed in Vietnam. Right. Pippi's over there. He's just a boy. <laughs> Stop overacting. Um, Everybody knows that reference. You know, but <laughs> my readers are young. Too. Yeah, that's why my life is all chicks. Right. Um, uh, the, but Oakland does, it's funny how like your environment so informs your work, like Chicago was so heavily influenced in, in like the right. early eight balls, it's so, Chicago is Yeah, it was so all in trenchant. the early eight balls, it was completely Chicago, and then when I was doing Ghost World, I, Killed moved, I, I moved to get California, but I still had like the, the Chicago in my head, so it's, so it's like palm trees and beaches and California mixed with Chicago. 
Mm -hmm. So everybody go, oh, that story's set in suburbia. You really captured suburbia, and it's like, no, it's just this weird mixture of like urban horror decay and and you know California nonsense. Yeah, but and that, that is somehow all... equals suburbia. But that is true. I mean, but that is also real. And like you yeah. know, like uh, Tim Burton has that. Like right. to him, the blight of Burbank was so right. palpable so that it moved him powerful. to make the same movie twenty times. Right. <laughs> um, He'll get it right one of these days. <laughs> yes, young man in the back, Tom. A lot of people have talked to me about it. Nobody with any money has ever talked to me. About it. <laughs> it's always like the student film, you know, like I want to make this as my student film. That's funny because I know the person that controls the money. <laughs> <Can you imagine? laughs> they could help him. You need um, somebody who looks like Tina, like some actress who looks like a potato. <laughs> this is for me. Yeah, I think you could do that. Could find it. I always think Velvet Glove will be like the most popular movie of 2040. Like our <laughs> our culture will have like gotten so extreme that that will just be like a PG film <laughs> but, long but, after I'm dead. You know? But I think it could. In the right hands, I think it could be a movie because the visuals are already established in the way that I don't think that um, Geek Love could be. Yeah. I think it could be a horrible movie. Geek love. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, That would be a good pitch for it. Yeah. The Arturo, the Aqua Boy tie-in at Burger King, you would have. <laughs> but uh, I think that because, you know, that it, it is funny because, you know, move, whereas, you know, books tell stories of an, an interior story, a story of intention, movies j can show action. Right. And it's really a graphic novel is the midpoint between those two. Yeah, know, yeah. It, it, that is sort of its niche. It would be I, no. I'm. I'd like to make it as a movie, but you know, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, often a wise choice. <laughs> right. This, um, this little guy. Right. Uh, so when you write a graphic novel, do you ever write a script, or do you just write Google sketches? How, what's your process for, for that? Um, he's asking my process for writing a, a comic. Um, I actually don't have a set process, and it's not. It's not because like I. I want to, you know, switch around all the time. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to find like the right way to do it. I know there's like a way out there that's going to be like, bingo, I've got it. You know, this is my system from now on, and it works every time. And then I, you know, I'll do one book, and then okay, the next one I'm going to write up the whole script in advance, and then the next one is I don't want to write the whole script in advance. I'll just draw it panel by panel without any idea of what's going on. <coughs> And I just veer all around wildly, and they all come out basically the same. So it, it doesn't seem to matter. It is that it is, a, it is a, that thing that you always end up doing. Like if, if when you write a screenplay, you have X amount of time. It's always like the last four days. Fuck! 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 <laughs> right. Fuck! I got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's real. Let's take a couple more, and then. And then you got to go to the baby. I literally have to go to the airport. <laughs> Apologize. Uh, unless we're we're full up. All right. It's teeming with people, and yet we seem to have answered every question. There's one. Weirdly. Last question. There we go. Better uh, be good. You seem to have a heavy strength of surrealism. You and uh, Chester Brown, who I both admire your visual Thank you. styles, and I think they're very um, innovative. But I wonder if you have any, outside of comics, if you have any influences from surrealism. From surrealism? I, um, I don't know. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> This event is over. Yeah. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. <laughs> this, this, this hearing is finished. <laughs> Take your shoe and bend it on. I actually don't have a good answer. For, I mean, I I like the surrealist and I like you know Bunuel films and stuff, but I can't say I was deeply influenced by any of that stuff. You know, except just by osmosis, kind of you know knowing about it and. Are you a Dennis Potter film? fan? I wasn't until um, a couple of years ago. I actually n never sat through any of those until uh, four or five years ago, and yeah. then I watched them all at once. The BBC singing detective. Yeah, exactly. Detective. That's it's amazing. Yeah. Have you ever seen the Robert Downey Jr. one? So I always meant to. The I'd, like, I'd love to see it just it's for that. Great. It's as awesome reasons. as Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, not everybody could make that story, boy. <laughs> you know, my my kid would make it interesting <laughs> by accident. <Right. laughs> yeah. What's that? Tiger gorilla on a horse with a sword? <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. So, uh, what is the? Are you? Uh, is there a signing? Uh, you gonna do? I believe I'm gonna sign sign? some books. Okay.
and uh, and it's uh, available here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, To the, to, the, to the people that I was know here, Ben and Tom, and uh, forgive me, I am quite literally running out the door and going to the airport. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for having another round of applause. It was great. Uh, books are for sale. Books are for sale at the counter. We're going to clear away these chairs. In fact, if you're sitting in a chair and could hold it, that would be super helpful. And then we're going to have a signing right here. Thank you all for coming. Oh, I want to see.